Hi everyone, welcome to those who are already already on time and making it in. Welcome to you, thank you very much. You should be able to uh, see our screen. Um, today we're here for sustainability, sustainability trends in connected packaging. So welcome to you all. As you're all coming in, um, let me just move to the next slide because you'll be able to scan the QR code in the bottom hand corner there with your chance to win a hundred uh, pounds Amazon voucher and be part of the connected packaging survey. As everyone's still coming in, let me just welcome you all. As I say, we are here to see the sustainability trends in the connected packaging webinar. And we're joined by two fantastic guests uh, today, David and Cyril, who I'm going to introduce you to in a little while. So before we dive into the webinar, I'd like to share a few important details with you. Firstly, this is a live webinar, so this is being recorded. Please uh, do take opportunity of that, uh, which means you have the opportunity to ask questions uh, through the QA and we will get to you as many questions as we can uh, during the session. As I said, it's recorded. Um, this is live, but it is being recorded, which means that you can also revisit it later uh, on YouTube and you can find that alongside all of our other content and past webinars and we also have our podcast called The Talking Giraffe which you'll be able to uh, look out as well. For those who are just joining a big welcome to you you should be able to see on your screen um, a QR code in the bottom right hand corner. This allows you to be able to get involved uh, with our connected packaging survey. It also gives you opportunity to win a hundred pounds Amazon voucher. So please do get involved so you can be part of the 2024 Connected Packaging Survey and you'll also um, receive a copy of the free report. So please do take advantage of the QA box. You can ask David and you can ask Cyril, you can also ask myself any questions that may come into your mind um, as we go through. Again, my warmest welcome to you all. Let's start uh, by, a, by a poll. Let's quickly understand a little bit connected packaging um, awareness. So how familiar are you uh, with the concept of connected packaging and its potential for enhancing sustainability uh, communication strategies? Is that very familiar, not familiar, somewhat familiar? Let's see what our audience are. Oh, a bit, a bit of a mix between uh, very familiar. Good. So 63%, oh, about half. Very familiar, somewhat familiar, and not familiar at all. So, okay. We have the opportunity here uh, to be able to see where our education needs to start from so let, let me start let me start by introducing our esteemed speakers you can see on our screens today we have Cyril Duray he is a fantastic founder of Choose Planet A and many other companies he's just been telling me about as well uh, in the green room um, they have a fantastic uh, product which has just won time best invention 2023 it's won the Penta Award Sustainable Packaging Design Silver Award and German Design Award 2023. So a big welcome to you, Cyril. Thanks very much for being here. And David, we have David Landsberg. He is the founder of Little Lotto. It's an amazing concept where you have to bin it to win it. He's going to tell us a lot more about that. But at the moment, they are almost at 11 million pieces of litter binned since they started 18 months ago. So we know what, what you're doing, but now let's get a little bit more personal. Can you tell us an interesting fact that not a lot of people know about you? And I'm going to shoot to you straight away, David. Morning, Jenny. Uh, thanks for hosting this, by the way. Very interesting. Um, uh, if you ask my wife, she'll tell you there's absolutely nothing interesting about me. Um, I think that probably the things that people don't know about me is that I like to do a bit of stand up and I like writing humorous novels. It's uh, it takes away the stress and angst uh, and uh, of, of what I go through with the business. So that's your backup plan, is it, David? Backup plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Good. Good. Cyril, how about yourself? Yeah, Jenny, thanks for having us today. Um, great to be here on your show. Um, Simeus and David, there's, there's not many things that 
uh, my wife would say interesting about me and all the really interesting stuff that nobody knows about me, I'd rather not say it. Um, but something that's really cool is while I, I lived in Shanghai for eight years and when I was there in 2009, not many people were speaking English. So I had to learn to speak Chinese. Oh, wow. And now today I live in Hong Kong. So wherever I walk on the street, I understand you know, what's going on. And whenever I speak back to the locals, in Chinese, they're always like really surprised. So it's kind of nice, you know, this, to have this edge, you know, um, in a country where people think that you don't understand, but actually you do. Uh, yes, yes, that's that's happened to me a few times, and you can actually then kind of butt into their conversation while they think they're talking about you, and you and you actually understand. Yes, a hundred percent. Well, great. Thank you very much. Great just to get to know you guys a little bit more. So, what are we going to be looking at um, through today's webinar? Here's what we're going to try and cover um, in the next hour. So really talking about the rise of sustainability, looking at sustainability packaging essentials, understanding how connected packaging can really enhance that in terms of strategy and communication, some real world success stories, and then looking at some industry trends. So we've got a lot of things to, to, to crack on with. And I think it's really obvious that in recent years, sustainability and packaging has become increasingly significant. It's been primarily driven by two factors, environmental concerns, but also shifting consumer preferences. There has been, I feel, certainly since COVID and before, but certainly since COVID, a huge change um, in perspective. But there's also environmental impact of packaging materials, a lot of legislation that has been changing as well around single-use plastic. We, I'm sure you've heard a lot of different news stories around this and also marketing around the excessive use of non-biogradable materials, how that is contributing to pollution, ocean de degradation, wildlife harm. This is obviously prompting governments, organisations to take action. There's a lot of different changes in legislation. Um, there's a lot of different changes in import, export tax, CBAMP, which is all coming as well. But this is all affecting the consumers and consumer preferences. And modern consumers are now more environmentally conscious than ever before. Several studies show that consumers prefer products and brands that demonstrate a commitment to sustainability. Shoppers are actively seeking out products with eco-friendly packaging that aligns with their values. Brands that recognize this trend can gain a competitive advantage by adopting sustainable packaging practices. In fact, a recent McKinsey study shows that those brands are growing at about 10% faster. So what we're talking about is not only doing something good for the planet, but actually this is also doing something good for, for businesses. Now, just going back to the poll, um, there were some people who were not familiar at all with connected packaging. Just to quickly give you that update, the connected packaging refers to a QR code or an NFC or RFID tag um, being implemented in or onto the packaging that allows the consumer to interact with the packaging by just using their phone. So it's a different way of being able to access additional information. Connected packaging and sustainability therefore are intrinsically linked. One of those being able to talk about transparency, the particular journey that that product and its ingredients has been on. Where have the materials come from? Where are the ingredients being sourced? There are a lot of information around the environmental impact. Um, and of course, one of the things that connected packaging can do is actually inform the 60% of people that don't actually know which bin their um, product or packaging or litter should be going into. So David, that comes very neatly to you, I think. And tell us a little bit about your perspective on sustainability. Um, well, uh, I'm actually, I, I'm equally worried uh, and confident about sustainability. I, I think, you know, the message is getting out there now. Consumers are more switched on to it. Um, there is an awareness that means that there's more investment going into uh, innovations that are tackling the issue. So, you know, in no, you know, in our small way, Cyril and I, and and you know, the millions of other businesses like ours that are tackling areas in some part that re relate to uh, sustainability, um, we're going to be the future. 
um, you know, the millions of businesses that are doing it. And there are some that are doing, you know, so there are some solutions coming out there that are, you know, highly ambitious, cleaning up seas and doing all sorts of things. So I'm very confident that, you know, there is a future where we are sustainable. There is a future where we will solve the issues of today. I'm only worried about the number of people there are on the planet. That's that's our biggest problem, that, you know, we can solve all the sustainability issues today, but there's actually too many of us on the planet that, uh, to, you know, to keep it going forward. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point as well. Um, Cyril, what about yourself? Are there any recent innovations in sustainable packaging materials that you feel have gained significant attention in the industry? Yeah, I mean, I agree with David. Um, the time is really not to change. And uh, we've seen for the past 20 years, really, the, the rise of alternative uh, material to packaging like uh, PLA, you know, uh, it was launched more than two decades ago in Europe and also in the US. And I think that was a great alternative, you know, to fossil phase uh, plastics. The thing is, today PLA is considered as a plastic because the polymer chain are very similar. And since there have been a lot of development, you know, in the industry. Um, if we take, for example, macrofibrillid cellulose, this is made from any cellulose uh, mainly from wood, and this is a great alternative to plastic films because macrofluoridated cellulose films have very, very low barriers to uh, humidity and to oxygen, and they are a great replacement for food packaging, for example. So all your cereal bars that are traditionally packed in a plastic wrap, here with macrofluoridated cellulose, you can replace them, and they are certified compostable. They're not coming from fossil, but from, from the cellulose from trees or from flowers or from really any cellulose. Cellulose is everywhere in the environment. Um, and then when you go even deeper for the past five years now, we talk about nanocellulose. So these are cellulose that are actually really, really small and we can apply them into coatings. So the great advantage of that is instead of using a barrier made of plastic that you coat on paper, you can use nanocellulose barriers into paper that are certified recyclable and compostable. But at the same time, you reach performance than plastic can also achieve. So we, we're really in a stage now where you look like companies that are using um, seaweed base, you know, like not PLA in the UK. And th these guys are certified plastic free by the EU regulation, which is great. But to me, the future of our planet is not to use um, you know, a raw material, something you know that is new. I think we have to use what is the leftover, what is the waste into our environment in order to make new material. And as an example, um, Cruise Company was also one uh, who was listed on Time Magazine. I'm, I'm, um, I had many discussions with the founder and Cruise Form, what they do is they take shellfish waste all across the US and also Mexico Bay because shellfish waste creates huge amount of pollution. You have to imagine tons and tons of just shellfish waste dump into the ocean every day and on the same spot you create a lot of pollution for all the all the life there so they take the shellfish they turn into ketosan polymers and that creates a substitute to styrofoam that is that is made from waste and it's also compostable and it's not damaging the environment so like, like david and like you jenny I'm, I'm very positive about the future but we need to accelerate dramatically now I think one of the things that just kind of struck me when you started talking about the different types of materials and things is that, of course, you know that very well. And I've been working um, in the packaging industry now for about eight, maybe 10 years, actually. But that all still sounds quite difficult and uh, confusing to understand. And that's to me. And uh, I've been working in this industry for a few years. So if you think about a consumer who hasn't got any uh, insight around PET versus poly versus mono versus whatever it might be. Um, I can see why we have this problem, um, which is around the consumer being able to understand what to do. Um, I don't know, David, if you if you want to add anything around that, because to me, it's it's all very well that the companies can make lots of change. But at the end, we need the consumer, right? We don't just need the consumer. The consumer is not stupid anymore. You know, we're all aware when we're being greenwashed. And uh, 
I think that the days of greenwashing are finishing, uh, thankfully, because, you know, we've all had enough of it. You know, these, these ridiculous claims that are being made, these spurious claims that no one can ever sort of prove or follow up on. Mm. Um, and I think now's the time that brands that um, brands have the opportunity to show they've got proper and serious aspirations to actually do something for the environment, um, not just, you know, uh, little comments on the back of their packaging, which is sort of sweet talk. Um, and I think brands that don't do that are going to be called out now, um, which is why smart packaging is the future. Uh, it's it's an opportunity to, you know, packaging's a billboard. It's the opportunity to use that billboard and shout out about the sustainability options um, and, you know, a shameless push for Recycle Lotto, which is what we're going to be working with you on, Jenny. Um, but, you know, an opportunity to actually explain to consumers what to do with their packaging at the end of life and to show to show the consumers that they actually care, that they actually care about what's going to happen to the packaging at the end of life. Yes, ab absolutely. Absolutely. So that brings me maybe um, to, to a poll and the poll is about sustainability information. Do you as a consumer and we're all consumers here, feel like you would like to receive more information about a product sustainability features or even just where to recycle it through a QR code, through an NFC tag. Would you find it valuable? Would you find it valuable perhaps depending on the product or would you prefer not to know um, about that information or, or wouldn't interact? At the moment, we see a lot of people on the positive side. Don't see anyone on the negative um, hopefully that's not encouraging <laughs> anybody anybody to go there. But I think if we end there, we have 63% finding it uh, valuable and 37, it's still changing, 37% um, there may be depending on the product. So again, it's it's very clear we don't have enough information. And I think what you mentioned, David, around greenwashing, um, I... I pondered yesterday about putting an image into this uh webinar because i actually picked up a carton of a product i will say no more and it actually said uh naught percent uh carbon footprint and i thought okay so how is that possible and then when i looked closer it said going to be so hang on a sec First of all, there's no carbon uh, footprint in anything that this company is doing in producing this product. And then secondly, actually, you're making that claim, but it says we're going to be absolutely insane. That should be called out. So that's the type of thing I think you're you're talking about. Right, David? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're not stupid anymore. Uh, and if we're not calling it out, then, you know, uh, there will be some organisation somewhere calling it out. And it's just going to make that brand, you know, it will go down several notches in people's uh, estimation, won't it? It's the brands that are really being proactive now. It's a brand, yeah. you know, forget about legislation. It, the legislation is that, 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 that the legislation is behind the curve anyway. It's the brands that are one step ahead of the legislation that are really going to make a difference now that are actually going to step up to the mark and say, we want to show consumers we're doing something. It's good for business. It's good for business. You know, they're going to get, yeah. um, you, you, you mentioned the McKinsey report. Forbes did one as well. That's something like, you know, I think it was over, I can't remember the exact detail. It was over 90% of consumers favor brands that have got some yeah. support for the, system, for the environment. Um, so it's good for business to do it. I don't know why there's not, you know, I'm, well, I'm sure because of uh, webinars like yours um, and the products we're working with you on, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more brands that are going to be doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the consumer plays a role. Cyril, what role um, consumer perception, behaviour, um, how do you see the consumer's role um, really in, in driving this adoption of, of sustainable packaging materials? I mean, I agree with David, uh, consumers are not stupid anymore. And that's, and thankfully it's because the way we communicate today, if you look at even 10 years ago, we didn't have as much social media, we, we had the internet, but today I think consumers really share what they see on the shelf and they can also show some brands that do well and some brands that don't do well. So the consumer really have the power in their hand with the mobile phone to really show information. The thing to me is there's also a lot of misinformation out there because yes, consumer can recognize what is plastic, what is paper, but we've seen a lot of brands switching from a plastic packaging film 
to suddenly a, a paper, you know, a brown craft, beautiful, but inside is still laminate plastic and is still not recyclable in a paper stream. So with, with, you know, the inflation that we have seen for the past two years, it's very difficult for brands and also for companies to move from, you know, plastic to something more sustainable because there's nothing cheaper than plastic, let's face it. You know, uh, I help brands and large group every day, you know, with a sustainability strategy. And I can tell you, you know, it's not it's not easy. A lot of them in Europe think that by having a plastic packaging that is made from mono material and they can say it's fully recyclable, they think it's green. It's not green because in Europe, only 25% of plastics are recycled. And I'm sure you know that also, David, because that's your brand and butter. So what happened to the 75%, you know, that is not recycled? Well, it's rather incinerated, but not often. And more likely it goes to the environment to the landfill. So yeah. claiming that, yeah, my plastic packaging is fully recyclable doesn't mean it's going to be fully recycled. Uh, and so and that's where we need to educate him up here and the consumer about that. Absolutely. That's such such a good point. It could be recycled <laughs> is, is, is really the claim, right? Um, so that brings me to the packaging itself, right? So sustainable packaging is, is a, well, as you know, is an approach to designing, producing and using packaging materials that prioritizes the reduction of its impact on the environment. Um, of course, that then takes us to this fantastic product, uh, the Good Cup. Cyril, tell us, tell us a little bit more um, about the Good Cup. Yeah, so the story of the Good Cup is, is me something like 16 years ago celebrating my 30 years old at Glastonbury Festival in the UK. And, and Glastonbury Festival is one of the largest music festivals, I think, in the world. They host like 200,000 people over a full week. And for me, it was, it was an eye-opener to how much waste human being can consume within a week at 200,000 people scale. Um, every day, you know, we just put our, our rubbish into the bin and it magically disappears, you know, every week. So we don't really see the scale of what we're consuming. And after Glastonbury 16 years ago, after a week, I could see, I couldn't see the grass. I couldn't see, it was actually mud because it rained a lot. Um, but there was so much waste, I realized we need to change it. And it's not about way, packaging that needs to be recycled. It's packaging that needs to disappear into the environment, leaving no trace or, or no contamination to the soil. So the idea was, when I started my, my own business five years ago, to revamp traditional packaging. And the first one is to revamp a traditional paper cup that we all consume coffee dramatically all across the world. And the idea was to remove the plastic lid and find about something else. And so the idea was, why don't we extend the wall of the traditional paper cup instead of doing a rim and then the extended wall can fold and lock in place and, and being a lid. So, um, but we didn't stop there. We didn't stop at just removing the lid. We also removed the plastic liner inside. It took us years to find a coating company that were not using fossil base, that were certified compostable, that were certified biodegradable and recyclable in a paper stream, but more importantly, certified plastic free by Flustics in Europe. So today we, yeah, we, you know, I've, I've been working out for five years and now for the past two years, we have a team that joined a company. It's not, it's a startup still, but a growing startup. And we have launched a cup uh, globally. I mean, uh, it's going to be available in the UK like uh, in, in just one month. We have containers coming. We're already available in Canada, in Australia, in in the US, and also in Japan. So, yeah, we, we can see a rising, rising demand for the consumer with all the consumer service also that we have done across the world. And this is a 100% plastic-free cup. So we cannot say 100% plastic-free because, once again, that can fall under greenwashing. Okay. And in Europe, we cannot say I'm 100% plastic free. You need to back up your data with something. So we don't say we're plastic free, but we say we are certified plastic free by Flustix, who's an organization in Germany that uh, do a lot of testing, like TUV about compostability. But they look if at the end of the life, there is any microplastic into the packaging. Okay. Okay. So again, it's really good to be open and not make wild wild claims but this cup is paper based and has obviously a, a ability to be fully compostable correct 
Yeah, correct, which is not the case of 99% of all the cups around the world because what you don't see is on most of the cups around the world, it's a plastic film that is glued inside. And so when the cup biodegrades into the environment or in the ocean, the paper decomposes really fast, but what is left over, it looks like a plastic cup. Mm-hmm. That's plain and simple. And the coating that we're using is a spray that is plant-based. And after six six months, you know, in the compost, it, it completely disappears. There's nothing. There's, there's no residue of microplastic and uh, it doesn't contaminate the soil. So in terms of disposable packaging, this is the best solution that you can have right now on the planet. Really, really, really interesting. And so the the, the point here is, it's better for humans because there's no ingestion of, of microplastics as such, but it's also better for the planet as well. Um, and what do, you know, what did people say? So using, using connected packaging, using QR codes, you were able to really then find out some feedback if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so before we launched uh, this product, we wanted to trial it in a few coffee shops. So we, as a sales director um, in the UK, just uh, went to speak to a lot of coffee shops. A lot of them are super interested, but they were not committed. Mm-hmm. But we we had a, a coffee chain where we tested the cup for about six to eight weeks in two different locations. And we had a QR code on the cup. We had a QR code also where, on the billboard when the consumer were collecting the coffee. And by scanning the code, we asked them some very simple question about yes, no, or easy, fair, no, easy, didn't try. So within a minute, they could answer the experience with the cup. And what we wanted to know really is, um, you know, is it easy or open to close? You know, because suddenly you have a folding mechanism that you don't have on a, on a plastic lid. Um, and then, you know, we ask you, you know, when you drink from it, do you feel it's more secure, secure, fair? Uh, then we ask them about how is your drinking experience, you know, with the paper spout compared to, you know, a, a plastic spout. And overall, I mean, we had like super, super positive response. For us, it was really to test for the first time this product with like, I think we had like 300 consumer uh, that, that tested it. And we wanted to see if we needed any tweakings or if we needed, you know, to, to change. Uh, some of the graphics or some of the instructions, but overall the cup today is the same as when we tested it two years ago. So gathering data was very important for us for the development and the launch of the product globally. So a really easy way to be able to get some feedback and help you continue with that development process using using connected packaging. So that's great. Yeah, um, and I mean, you, you know it, Jenny, because we, we've done this together. Uh, you helped us a lot, you know, to to prepare, you know, all these questions, to prepare also all the software that goes behind. That's what you do on daily basis. And, and with your help, we were very successful, you know, achieving what we were looking for. So, um, yeah, I think in any company really that launch a product should test it on the market mm-hmm. with connected energy. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's and it's real time information. You're able to actually understand in real time what people are thinking about your product. You don't need to wait six months to get the the results oh. back. Correct. It's um it's a really great way. I also think opening this communication channel um to be able to get uh, trust. It's uh, a great way to be able to get a consumer to understand a brand a little bit more, and I think that will also therefore drive loyalty um david how can companies earn consumer trust and loyalty by sharing their efforts do do you feel that this is going to work in a way where consumers have so much more access uh to information they yeah consumers certainly that you know there's a hunger to digest small bits of information uh, rather than giving chapter and verse you know no one wants to read the small print on a box but um, but they want you know we're we're at a time now when we we expect to be rewarded for our attention. Um, we want little snippets. We want little bits of information that we're going to get a reward. We there's something in it for us to just absorb some information. So that's why I think gamification rewards you know uh, um, uh, incentivization. I think that's why all this is such an important step for uh, for packaging for for brands to use on packaging. Definitely, definitely. We've actually just got a question in um, from the audience. Cyril, it's about, about sorry, the good cup. Um, they're asking, are you planning to launch everywhere in Europe? Is it ever coming to France? What, what's, what's the plans for the launch? 
Yeah, we 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 launching. We when when we wanted to launch, we just concentrate our time in in countries where sustainability is already really well accepted by the consumer. So Australia, for example, is leading the way in terms of sustainable packaging. They have compost everywhere. And, and the mindset of Australia and living on such a big island, they understand that waste is difficult actually to, to manage. So we launched in Australia, that was really successful. We have three distributors there. We launched also in Canada, we have two distributors there. In the UK, we just signed two distributors um, and there's a lot of things happening. Like really, really a lot of, of big, big brands now um, are planning to do some trials. So I cannot reveal who, but in Q1, Q2 next year, we, we will see we will see some some large uh, players probably adopting the good cup. For France, we already have a, a French distributor as well. And for all the other country, it's we, we you know we start from a point and then we we just extend it. But we see also the Nordic countries like uh, Finland, Sweden, or Denmark so much interest. So it's coming. But the thing is, when you launch a product like the good cup, that is so disruptive uh, to the industry and is also new to adopt. Uh, it takes time for the company, also for the consumer, to um, to, to take on board. But uh, yeah, it's it's gonna come rapidly now. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And as as you say, it takes time for the consumer uh, to get involved. And David, you were talking about you know the ability to get trust, the ability to to align um, your brand in the right way to avoid greenwashing. Um, this is this is actually a, a different example from Woodlands Dairy that we created, which was there to really understand and educate at the same time. So understand um, the audience's uh, education level um, in terms of recycling, in terms of the materials being used in the product. There was also a, a sustainability booklet that could be um, used. It was incentivized. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit about that as well. It was um, incentivized to win a shopping voucher every week if you answered answered the quiz. Um, the, the interesting thing is this really does show, um, again, what David, you mentioned in terms of being able to not just be good for the planet, but be also good for business. This actually ran for a three month uh, period. There was a shopping voucher that was given away once a week. What they actually saw was an engagement time of the brand of two minutes and 14 seconds on average. So that's a good amount of time. But most importantly, I think for them is they saw a 30 percent increase in sales. So, you know, again, that comes to your your point in terms of being able to say, yes, we're aligning the brand. Yes, we're actually doing something here. We're educating you about what we're doing. And actually, the benefit is not only doing something good, but also getting some some business uh, advancement or revenue increase because of that. David, a, a question in general, how open are brands to changing their packaging with the new QR codes uh, to include sustainability messaging? Um, how are you finding that? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, we've just launched this part of our, we've just, this, this, this initiative, if you like. Our focus in the background has always been on litter and now we're about um, we're about waste segregation and we're about getting the getting the right waste in the right bin at home so this is this is quite a new area we've started talking to brands on they're very receptive they're very excited by it but you know you're saying how receptive the issue with big brands by the nature is that they're very slow they have to you know it's a very long slow process but the interest has been fantastic and i think there is a real appetite now for brands to understand that actually if they're not doing it they're going to be left behind mm, definitely definitely I'm just putting on screen now um, a, a, a fantastic slide that I think you can talk around a little bit to give us a little bit more information um, and tell us a little bit more about Little Lotto and, and Weetabix. Yeah, thanks for that. So um, so just again, the, the background was we started with incentivizing people to put litter in the bin. Little Lotto was about, you know, uh, it's still about, you know, take a picture as you've been litter and you go into a prize draw every week for £1,000. Um, in the UK, it's different in different countries. Um, I'm just looking now at the live counter. There's 10.759, 10, 10,759,133 live counter. That's how many pieces of litter have been binned. We then realised that, of course, that, you know, that's fantastic. We can address litter. But what about waste in the home, getting the right stuff in the right bin? Um, so we've come up with uh, um, this initiative that allows brands to put a QR code. You can actually trial this one. This QR code's live, although um, uh, it won't be the finished experience. This is just an example. 
where you know on the side of packaging a brand that has a qr code like that scan it without scan it with a smartphone it pops up with uh without having to have an app on it it pops up with what what packaging that is and we know where it is and we can say well in this council you need to put this in that bin and here's your incentive to do that um and like i say it's a new initiative the feedback has been fantastic it won't be out there for some months yet because of the you know the 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 the, the, the way in which these big brands work but um it's all about actually incentivizing people to do the right thing with the packaging in their home. And the interesting thing, Jenny, and you know the power of this, is that it gives it gives brands the opportunity to communicate with their customers at the end of packaging life, which is quite a unique you know, opportunity. And it's the time when they're most likely to make their buying decision on what they're replacing it with. So, you know, in this example with Weetabix, somebody's going to bin their box of Weetabix, they're going to be told, well, in this council, you need to put it in your brown bin or blue bin or whatever it may be. Um, and by the way, here's a coupon for, you know, replacing it with Weetabix or it could be hijacked by Kellogg's or whoever it is that, you know, wants to put that message in there. Mm. <laughs> OK, I hadn't thought about uh, hijacking uh, the space. Very, very much media, media focused there, David. Love that. Um, I think that's a really good point. And I think also something that we saw from... Cyril's connected packaging example and something we can see from this example that you're talking about, David, is also all of that analytics, all of that data can be collected on the back end as well. So when did they scan? Um, you know, how long did they get involved for? As I said in my last example, you know, what was the level of education? Did people actually know the answers to the questions or not? Because if they don't know the answers to the questions that you're asking, well, then your communication as a brand needs to come down a few notches because they actually haven't caught up with where you are or the reverse um so i think that's a really important point as well being able to really understand what your consumers think what your consumers are doing how much do they um, interact with it how much of your uh litter how much of your packaging as a brand is actually being binned in the right place is there a, any particular geographical uh elements there that kind of give you an in interesting insight or an interesting story um around what's happening so there's there's, there's a really great piece around data but I think there's also something which is around um, the government and the regulations that are, are, are taking taking place and taking effect. And there's a lot of different government regulations that are that are changing. Um, there's a lot of things around the circular economy package. There's a lot around ESG. There's a lot around CBAM. Um, a lot of different things that are happening. David, what do you feel? around um, companies being able to keep up with the new rules? You know, give, give me some insight there. Well, unfortunately, you know, in, in typical, in the UK, certainly, um, if you look at EPR, which is Extended Producer Responsibility, um, in the UK, DEFRA are making a bit of a, uh, I'll be polite, making a bit of a mess of it because they held back the main thrust of how they're going to work EPR. They have held back most of the terms of EPR they've confused the hell out of most brands, uh, most packaging companies, um, mm. as well as councils and, and waste uh, waste collection companies. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a mess at the moment, but in other countries, they, they're, they're starting to make inroads. So <clears throat> I've always been of the opinion, if you have to wait for legislation, you know, before you decide what you're gonna do with your packaging, you're behind the curve. You need to be mm -hmm. one step in front of it. So, you know, I think that everyone gets a sense of where, EPR is going to be taking them to. Um, and I think that that's that should be giving them the steer on what they need to be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. But I think in short, sure, yeah. in the UK it's a mess, but it's it's starting to get take up in different markets. Yeah, abs absolutely. And uh, you know, France being quite a, quite ahead in that sense. Cyril, what do you feel around uh, that question of legislation and brands being able to understand it and potentially consumers too? Yeah, David mentioned it well. I mean, I think regulation are really a necessity, but not all of them, I would say, are, are beneficial or sustainable to the environment. Um, but the policy have been changing a lot, like really, really a lot. And I think it's very hard for companies to really put a strategy in place for to, to find out, you know, what, what they should do, what model they should have, should it be recycled, should it be compostable? Um, and if you look at, for example, the, the ban of single-use plastic, for example, for takeaway packaging, 
it's a necessity. I mean, this is polluting our environment for decades and mm -hmm. we have to change it. I think the problem that we have today is, yes, we have a lot of solutions for disposable, but also there's a huge debate about are we are we going to sustainable disposable packaging without plastic or actually is the government at some point is going to ban them and where we have to move to reusable and actually we don't know which one is better and th there's a lot of uh, misinformation in, in in our opinion into the into the consumer because when they see a paper packaging suddenly they think about okay this generates deforestation actually this this is not true you know i work for eight years for a paper manufacturer in Finland, and I can tell you that the Nordic countries have been cutting trees for more than 200 years, and there's more tree today than there were, you know, 200 years ago. So the, the packaging that we see in paper is not generating deforestation, you know, at least in Europe. Um, so, but it's this information, you know, that unfortunately is driving maybe government or maybe consumer that believe that actually reusable is better than disposable. Um, I mean, when, whenever I go to have a coffee, I always bring my own cup. And it's been the same, believe it or not, for the past 20 years. Uh, the same, you know, aluminum cup, you know, that I've been using for, for all this time. The problem is today, the, the solution that we see from reusable, it's mainly 99% of uh, virgin plastic. And these cups of plastic are five times more thick or heavy than the disposable one that just been banned. Um, mm. the, thing is, the thing is, nothing in this world lasts forever nothing you know even diamonds you know i mean you believe or not but the the thing is whatever we produce today it's going to end up in the bin and it's going to end up in the environment that's a fact okay so by saying that yeah you know my cup is reusable you know and you can visit a hundred or a thousand times great but anyway at the end of its life it will end up in landfill and that will become micro microplastic uh the other thing is uh, people say, oh, my plastic is recyclable, but plastic, you can recycle it two, three, four times maximum. That's how much you can recycle plastic. So, you know, we have to be careful about the regulation and where the government is taking us because um, I think reusable, I believe in reusable, but I think it needs to be without plastic. I think that's uh, that's something that we need to think about what is the end of life that what we're creating today. Mm, definitely. And I think that kind of, again rings out that we need clarity we need clarity we need clear communication we need a good understanding of the the truth um of what is happening paper is bad plastic is bad what it, that means everything is bad so you know th there's got to be some real understanding of, of of what that actually means and also transparency on on what's actually happening um uh, with the particular packaging um, or the particular production process that's happening as well. Um, we've got a question actually from Heather from the audience, and she says, could the retailers have the QR codes added to the price tag seen under the products on the shelves or have the QR codes as information posters around the product shelves? This could put more pressure on retailers to give the right information to their consumers. Anybody want to speak to that? Uh, I think I think that's down to the brands to put. You know, if the brand, if, if, it's if the brands um, uh, provide information, then the the supermarkets are going to be pressured to start delivering, aren't they? It, 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 it's got to be driven somewhere. I, the, the, there was another question that actually reminded me of the same the same sort of answer: Is the city stroke country ready to recycle all types of waste for big corporations? Um, um, I think it's the same thing. You know, if if they know the waste is there then they will they they will they will provide the solutions i think with all these things you know there's no point in waiting for all of the infrastructure to be in place we need to start taking the actions now mm. and that that will result in the infrastructure being put in place whether that's you know the supermarkets putting a label under the pricing uh on shelf or whether that's the council's uh, uh facilitating the collections and and, and on re and recycling of more waste streams I think as well, you, you you picked up half half of that question, but also it, it talks about, you know, a government's ready to treat all types of waste, um, end of life packaging as an interesting concept. I think you're right. At the end of the day, it's the brands who's got to, to lead this conversation, David, I think. Um, well, I think that's what you're saying, because 
Otherwise, A, we're going to be too late. B, as Cyril's saying, we're going to be, uh, as consumers, misled. Um, I think that the, the ownership of the impact that you're having does come down to the brands. I mean, Cyril, David, I don't know if you agree with that. Brands are in a prime position to lead this, to, you know, to, to fly the flag for this. Um, you know, it, it's going to be good for their brand, first of all. Mm. It's going to get them business. So that should be enough of an incentive to do it. Um, but it's what people are buying, you know, the consumers are buying um, that needs to needs to educate them on what they need to do with the waste streams. That That's, you know, the bottom line. So it's, it is the responsibility of the brand, but it's not just responsibility. It's great for business. So it sort of ticks every box. Yeah, definitely. Another question in um, from Santiago, he asks, is QR coding, especially for gaming, made for all FMCG categories or is it just is it more adapted for young consumers? Um, I don't know, David, if you've got anything to answer there. If it's not, I do. Uh, is, is Santiago asking is QR coding um, uh, specifically a young consumer? Um, yes. Uh, uh, well, look, I think that during COVID, uh, we all got very used to QR codes. Um, uh, certainly in the UK, certainly in, in, in Western Europe, we got very used to QR codes. Um, I think that um, uh, I think that QR codes are now, you know, part of part of everything that we do. So I don't think that it's just for young people. I think all age groups and of course, you know, um, the more QR codes are put out there, the more people are going to be educated on their use. Yeah, de definitely. I've just put on screen um, some of the different uh use cases i feel that connected packaging has so you know storytelling so telling the story of how you know from farm to plate um the whole kind of traceability the whole story educational content you know where we can talk about the materials that are being used um perhaps the changes that might have happened in the particular packaging or or product production um, of course, rewards and incentives. So that's speaking to to Little Lotto, but it's also speaking to any other type of loyalty program that could be um, put in place. Certifications and labels. So being able to, you know, come back to the standards and actually talk about, well, this actually, as Cyril says, is certified by this particular um, organisation. Um, but also feedback mechanisms, which we also saw um in the questionnaire from the from the good cup as well so being able to get that feedback did you understand this or did you use this or if it was a reusable system did you actually know that this was a reusable cup did you actually know you're supposed to take this back you know is this actually interesting to you all those different types of things we've got to be able to have this communication channel between the consumer and the brand because if the brand is going to lead it and the brand is going to actually do the right thing they've got to make sure that that consumer understands it um and therefore the brands can then make those changes a little bit like what Cyril was saying in terms of changing the the innovation as well um i'm gonna push back to you guys and ask if there a particular case study that you've seen or uh, caught your eye around sustainability and hopefully connected packaging um that you might be able to share with us uh, I've got to tell you, Jenny. I love your campaigns. I'm not. I, I, I'm. I'm not. You know. I know that. Uh, uh, I would say that anyway. It's not just because you've invited me along to your webinar, but I love your cam. I love the campaign you did for Tetra Pak, which was. It had all the ingredients of a good campaign. It was. It was fun. It was rewarding. So people got a reward. It was gamified. Um, I think it's those sorts of campaigns that work best, where people. There's a reveal, you know, people scan a QR code, there's a reveal, there's a bit of interaction, there's a reward. Uh, so I, I, I'm a great, I'm a great, uh, a great fan of the gamification you've done. Oh, thanks. Thanks, David. Yeah. Cyril, anything that comes into your mind? Um, yeah, a few years ago, I saw a beer brand. Um, I, I, I can't remember. I think it was a green bottle. Uh, it was a beer brand that wanted to promote the way that they were sustainable with their packaging by having a glass bubble that was washed, you know, many, many, many times and then back into the um, back into the system. So to promote really them being sustainable, they launched a beer bottle that had a QR code on the label. And the first person that ever drank that beer had the possibility to scan the code and add a message into the bottle. Uh -huh. And so 
Oh. When finishing the bottle, back into the system, being washed again. And then the second person that would drink the beer bottle scan the code and could see the message of the first person. And at the same time, he could also write another message for the third person. So, so this was actually, in terms of marketing and sustainability, super, super popular and very successful because it really shows that we can promote circular economy message in a very fun and educational way, you know, about the life of a bottle. And I think the campaign was named like message in a bottle, but I, I cannot remember. It was quite some time ago. Do David to sing, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. That's a, that's a great example. I, I wasn't actually aware of that one. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go look it up, but that's, that's a really fun way to, to bring some interaction to it, to make it fun um you know to use actually the whole the whole circular piece and, and bring your your community bring your users into it i i think that's a great example we've got a question from the audience alberto asks is there any priority in terms of industries food beverage over beauty perhaps i'll open that cyril to you first and then come to david well, the, the priority is to move away from plastic. I think that's the number one, because if you look at the data in the world, only 9% of plastic packaging are recycled in the world. So wow. we need to get away from plastic. Um, and I think the food and beverage industry have been leading the way for a decade now. Uh, the, the luxury the, the luxury segment, I think, really wants to change, but it's, it's difficult because they want to still remain premium. And so we still see a lot of overpacking. We see a lot of mix of material. Uh, they think, they believe that, you know, some of their packaging, you know, can last, you know, as a box that you can reuse at home, but actually eventually that's going to end up also in the bin. So I think we really need to look at alternative material that can be easily recyclable. And I think paper, glass, aluminum, this we know how to recycle pretty well in Europe. Uh, but anything elsewhere than that, I think it's it's a problem. Because when it's not recycled, it's really damaging environment. Absolutely, David. What what do you see? Food and beverage over beauty. Is there any in particular? The little lotto. Was there any particular brands that were more? No, I think the the thing about smart packaging is you can use it for whatever you want to use it for. So you know, it's not it's not for uh, it's it, there's not priority. You know, there's not a hierarchy in terms of. Um, uh, uh, you know which which sector it's useful for. Anybody that wants to see their product recycled properly uh, needs to use it. And be that an FMCG, be it you know a, 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 a cosmetics company, if it's got packaging, it's got a state on that packaging to put a, a QR code. You can communicate with your consumers that way. So uh, you know I think it's a no brainer for any brand. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Completely agree. It's about adaptation and going back to the question from before as well, it, it, gamification. Gamification is one use case and could be really good for a particular target market, but might not be very good for another. What's the message that you want to convey and to whom? And then create that that correct messaging based on that, I think. Um, I've got a, a, a very technical question um from dennis here um how popular do you think it will be to replace conventional triplex with aluminium in the production of stand-up pouches with a spout for sources and chemicals with 100 percent recyclable monomaterial that has comparable barrier properties cyril i think that should go to you if if uh, you can answer that that would be fantastic because i've got no idea but there's um yeah there's a lot more alternative today than there were even a few years ago um, I mean, I mentioned nanocellulose. I think this is, you know, a great, a great potential because when, when we talk about, for example, recyclability in paper, I think in the UK now, 90%, if you want the paper to be recycled, and you can correct me, David, because I'm not really up, up to speed with the regulation in the UK, but I think you need to have 90% of fiber and 10% of any other material. And I think with that kind of ratio, you can recycle paper. I think in Europe, it's similar. I think where we're going is probably towards 95% of fiber beds and probably 5% of a polymer or coating. So in order to replace you know, the triplex of aluminum and P and paper and so on, these are barriers with, I mean, when you have aluminum, it means that you need to have very, very high barrier to oxygen and humidity uh, for liquid packaging or even for dry packaging. We've seen, I've seen a lot of innovation out there. There's a brand in France called Silcoa, 
And what they do is they use clay as, as coating. And that, that clay goes in every single pore of the paper and end up as a great barrier uh, and can be also recycled with, with paper. So there's a lot of really, really good things happening out there and, and a lot of solutions. So anyone that's interested, I mean, just, just DM me and then uh, I, I can give you some, some tips. Fantastic, absolutely. We can connect you with uh, the panelists here. If uh, you would like to be, we can help you do that. Um, thank you, David, for mentioning the Tetra Pak campaign. Santiago is actually asking, what is the, the campaign? During that time, I've been able to find a screen that can help share that campaign. So thank you for that. Um, this is uh, the Banger campaign, and we do a lot of gamification, but I, I think this might be the one that, David, you were referring to. Um, this is a, a, a game um, which had lots of different parts to it. So basically, is the user scanned the QR code, they were able to find out about the new packaging. Banger was actually one of the first uh, brands to use the tethered caps, which are the caps which are attached. I don't know if you've you've seen those. Um, and basically, it was explaining it was explaining about the tethered caps, but it also had some gamification, which you can see here which was a simple game where you needed to avoid the bombs, avoid the sugar and actually slice the fruits and flavors that were the juice. Every time somebody got a certain number of points in this game, um, they actually then gave a donation to a children's charity um, that they supported as well. So here you can see lots of different uh, themes coming in. So connected packaging for good, education in terms of the tethered caps and the new packaging, um, and also that gamification uh, piece as well so a great way to be able to engage um, their consumers so hopefully that answers to uh, Santiago your, uh, well, your your question there yeah David really, that, that's a great I love that one too but there is another one on your website that I saw which is Tetra Pak specific so I can send you the link oh um, fantastic yes yes <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> That wasn't the campaign, but it was a good campaign and it was Tetra Pak. That was a great campaign. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, a quick a quick question here from um, Sanjiv, and he asks if the experts can give some information on any less expensive alternative packaging, say cellulose uh, or cellulose. I'm not how to, how to pronounce it, sorry. Um, where plastic is, is maddingly, maddingly used everywhere in India, is there any good alternative? Cyril, I think that's a good one for you. Yeah, I mean, in, India is actually uh, the largest country in the world with the recycling rate. I think there's something like 66% of plastic packaging that are recycled in India. And why? is because plastic is a commodity. People that collect plastic, you know, make money out of it. And here in Europe, you know, we see it as a trash. So, you know, India actually is, but India is still is, is developing. And, uh, and I think that, they, yeah, they will have soon the same problem as we have. Um, I mean, today, from, from my knowledge, there's, there's nothing cheaper. There's no cheapest alternative to, to, to plastic. If you want to move away from plastic, you need to pay at least twice the, twice the price. We, we've, seen some, um, we've seen some polymers out of sugarcane. We've seen some, some polymers, you know, make with, you know, a lot of different compositions. But at the end, these polymers, you know, are very similar to plastic. So they're not like really alternatives. To me, the alternative is, is to use some material that at the end of their life will biodegrade or decompose without harming the environment. And um, the, the, the solution really that I see coming is PHA. I don't know if you if you guys have heard about PHA, but uh, we have Dynamer Scientific in the US that is, is leading the way. And they've been collecting like colza flowers. We make biofuel out of that, but they collect colza flowers and they can turn it into a component that we can uh, make film, we can do injection molding, we can do extrusion blowing, we can do some coatings, and this is highly, highly um, compostable. Uh, the shelf life is short, but it's it's an amazing uh, it's an amazing material, and and that is that is coming very very soon. We see also China. There's like I'm not kidding, hundreds of companies now developing PHA, and the way they develop it is through actually waste of food. So they, they take the PHA from, from the wasted food that, that we throw away and they make material out of that. So um, so just to answer quickly the question today, you know, if you really want to go 
fully sustainable and not use plastic, you need to pay, you know, a price that is at least twice. That's that's uh, yeah, that's what I see currently. Can I just add to that, Cyril? That uh, we we've done a lot of uh, research and, and and I've been to India several times on this to to look at the the way because it's quite unique over there because there's such an army of informal waste collectors and waste sorters. Um, but it's a great example of because there is such an army of waste sorters and collectors, and therefore they can they can accumulate and collect vast uh, volumes of each individual type of item, type of plastic, it makes it viable to be recycled. So they've got soft plastic, plus soft plastic recycling in India that, you know, we would only dream of in, in, in Western Europe. Um, the rates yeah. of recycling are much, much higher there because of, because of the volumes collected by the informal waste sector and the viability that, that makes it, you know, possible to set up plants to recycle and there's chemical recycling as well which, which is much better for cellulose as well cellulite I should say <laughs> it's it's i've got so many different questions yet to ask but we've 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 run out of time sadly um so it's gone very 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 fast i think we've really highlighted at least um a lot of different alternatives a lot of different ways in which uh, brands can take the lead in which um you know we can look at being able to change some of the processes we can look at being able to highlight and communicate some of those changes by clearing up some of the communication as well making sure that we are really as a brand talking about what is the truth and not this greenwashing and being able to really understand that as consumers are increasingly valuing their environmental responsible products and brands then brands need to take um, action and make sure they're making the right choices as well thank you so much for your time david thank you so much for your time cyril it's been lovely having all the uh, fantastic questions from the audience as well so i thank you all and wish you all a very good day thanks, thanks very much thanks thank you nice to see you